As a kid, Steve Jobs just hated school. Now, many of us can relate, even if we're not brilliant business innovators. School bored the young Jobs painfully, and he reacted by engaging in acts of disobedience and defiance. I was pretty bored in school, he remembers, and I turned into a little terror, unquote. As a result, he was expelled from the third grade. A few years later, he loathed his junior high school. One day, he just refused to go back, and he was so adamant that his parents moved to another California town in hopes of finding a better school fit for him. Now, the adult Steve Jobs became one of the outstanding entrepreneurs of his generation, but his school experiences raise a question. Did Steve Jobs fail to adapt himself to the system? Or did the school system fail to fit Steve Jobs? Now, a related point, there was a team of uh, Japanese investigators, uh, education professionals. They came to the United States because they wanted to study its school system. You know, Japan's a very successful nation. It's prosperous, dynamic in many areas. But this team of investigators had a very specific question, and that was, why does our country have so few innovators? And they looked to the United States with its many centers of innovation, right? It's got Silicon Valley and technology, Hollywood movies, New York finance, Broadway theater, and so on. And in, in the business world, they noticed that it creates this large number of entrepreneurs, Bill Gates, Martha Stewart, Oprah Winfrey, Mark Zuckerberg, and the list goes on. So the Japanese education investigators, they had this question, what is it? that these American schools are doing so well at to generate so many creative, innovative entrepreneurs. Right? What's their quote-unquote secret ingredient? Now, this is an important question to me because we do live in an era that for the first time in history is taking entrepreneurism seriously. Obviously, there have been entrepreneurial people and entrepreneurial semi-cultures here and there, but in a much more self-conscious way, we're becoming increasingly aware of the importance of entrepreneurial thinking and activity. So partly uh, you can see this from looking at the business and employment environment. It's different than it used to be. Professor Stephen Rogers pointed this out, quote, In the 1960s, one out of every four persons in the United States worked for a Fortune 500 company. By the turn of the 21st century, only one out of 14 people works for those companies. Employment at Fortune 500 companies peaked at about 16.5 million people in 1979. Parenthetically, that's the year that I started college, unparenthesized, and that has steadily declined every year to approximately 10.5 million people now. Now, that's a major shift in the employment market. So who's working in the big Fortune 500 corporate sector and who's working in other sectors in the employment market? Now, economic theory has been transforming itself into what economists Arnold Kling and Nick Scholes call Economics 2.0. For several generations of professional economic theory, economists have ignored or downplayed the unpredictable and idiosyncratic entrepreneur. They've focused on abstracted, impersonal models. They focused on macro issues rather than micro issues. Now, of course, there have been contrarians such as Joseph Schumpeter and Israel Kirzner. They've argued for the importance of entrepreneurship, but they've been uh, lonely or lone voices uh, in the fringes of much of mainstream economics. And it's really only recently, within the last generation, that mainstream economics has been recasting itself on the basis of entrepreneurship. In the psychology literature, in the ethics literature, we also see a movement more toward understanding entrepreneurism right, as a key to a flourishing life, not just in our work lives, but in our overall lives. So psychologists such as Martin Seligman stressing autonomy, 
self-directedness, creative exploration. Those are the foundational ingredients for a psychologically healthy life. And then in business ethics and more broadly uh, in moral philosophy, we find philosophers now making connections between entrepreneurial traits and moral virtues in precisely in the context of making our careers an integral part of our overall flourishing lives. So we have this new entrepreneurial century. Uh, we see this reflected in the employment statistics. We see this in the economic theory, in the ethical theory, in the psychological literature. If these trends are correct, this then raises a question about education. We are parents. We are educators. How do we help our children and students? How do we prepare them for this entrepreneurial economy and an entrepreneurial life? Now for that, I think it's important to ask the right questions. And this is why I think the Japanese investigators, their question was an important one, but it was misfocused. The American secret ingredient, right? It's not in the schools. Right? Most U.S. formal schooling is government schooling, and most are not good at teaching entrepreneurism. You know, some schools, of course, in prosperous neighborhoods are solid, but most are weak. Many are terrible. Now, I don't know if you can relate to this, but consider the many kids who start school, kindergartners, first graders, they're full of energy, they're full of curiosity and excitement. After a few years, though, they come to dislike or even hate school. They're bored. They don't like science. They don't even like art. If you ask them what their favorite subject is, they'll say it's lunch and recess when they can actually go outside and play. And then on top of that, for several decades, as we've been measuring these things, we've seen a decline in test scores, more students graduating with weak reading skills, weak math skills, minimal scientific and historical knowledge. But at the same time, the U.S. does produce a large number of creative individuals. So how is this possible? Now, my view is that what American culture does well is what it does outside of school. And here I agree with Michael Petrelli. After school hours, one of the outstanding things about American culture is that they are busy with drama and chess clubs, sports, debate teams. American culture also has a huge amount of parental involvement in music lessons, trip to museums, galleries, sports leagues, summer camps, travel. And it is a prosperous country, so there's lots of wealth to support all of these informal learning opportunities. Now here I like to uh, think about music education. I think it's a perfect example. Everybody in the world loves music. And American culture has, over the 20th century, 21st century, had a huge amount of creativity in music. And so think of all the rock bands, the jazz clubs, symphonies in most cities, and a whole lot more. But here's the important point. That creativity did not come out of music education in schools. Instead, those who became musicians and music enthusiasts were inspired from popular culture. They learned from friends and families and informal networks like that, or by outside of school lessons that were paid for by their parents. So that raises a question. If most kids in formal school don't even like their music classes, what is it that we're doing in schools to turn something that everybody loves into a chore and something that they don't want to do? So this, I think, points to a big challenge for education reform. Schooling obviously has two major problems. It wastes so much of students' time. Uh, we can measure this by the students' self-reports about just how disengaged from what goes on in school they are. And, of course, it's then missing the opportunity to use its considerable resources, and we do put huge amounts of resources into schooling. Those resources are not being well used for preparing young adults for entrepreneurial careers and living. Join Professor Stephen Hicks on his Adventures in Postmodernism tour next March in Australia, where he'll be giving you his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Find out what makes postmodernism attractive. Why is it so dangerous? How has it evolved or mutated over the years? Does postmodernism have strong connections to neo Marxism? What is the role of it in cultural wars, campus battles over free speech, political correctness, intellectual diversity, identity politics, and the rise of Antifa and alternative right? 
What other political movements are now adopting postmodernism strategies, and how do we resolve these issues of postmodernism? Stephen Hicks will be appearing in four major Australian cities throughout March 2019. He'll be doing an evening talk in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide and Brisbane starting at 7pm and will be holding an all-day special event masterclass series starting at 9am on March 10th in Melbourne and March 16th in Sydney where he will delve even deeper into understanding postmodernism, its history and teach you valuable strategies to actually combat it. For full details and to reserve your tickets today, go to truearrowevents.com. Select the event to which you would like to attend, and if you hurry, you may even be lucky enough to get your tickets at early bird prices at a 50% discount. And while you're online, please leave us a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. So, Steve Jobs, uh, who in addition to his troubles in grade school, also dropped out of college. But he did put this entrepreneurial aspiration best, and this, I think, is what we educators need to keep in mind. Quote, your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking until you find it. Don't settle, unquote. Now, that's not what we're doing in most formal schools. So the question then is, how can we refocus schools to enable students to take on that great life challenge? I think one element of this has to be educating for entrepreneurship, and that means a serious rethinking. Now, what are the uh, essentials of entrepreneurship? If this is our new focus, we need to identify what's going on. So I've got a descriptive paragraph here, and I'm going to emphasize some concepts along the way describing the entrepreneurial process as I see it. So here goes. The entrepreneurial process it begins with an informed and creative idea right, for a new product. The entrepreneur then is ambitious and gutsy and then takes the initiative in developing the idea into a new enterprise through a lot of perseverance and then trial and error. The entrepreneur produces something of value. He or she then takes on a leadership role in showing consumers the value of the new product and showing new employees how to make it. The entrepreneur trades with them to win-win, mutually beneficial results, thus achieving success and enjoying the fruits of success. Now, what I want to do is pull out all of those concepts that I emphasized informed, creative ideas, ambitious, gutsy, initiative, perseverance, trial and error, productivity, leadership, trade, win-win, success, enjoyment. Right? Now, if those are what the essence of the entrepreneurial process is, and our goal is to educate for being entrepreneurial, the question then is going to be, how do we do those things. Now, I want to make a connection here to Steve Jobs, if he's our working example of a prototypical successful entrepreneur. How did uh, Steve Jobs become the entrepreneur who can do right all of those things, inform creative ideas, initiative, perseverance, leadership, and so forth? And uh, when we read in Steve Jobs' biography, he's often forthright in letting us know how he became the, the person that he did. All right, so let's talk about first informed and creative ideas. Obviously, um, entrepreneurs generate business ideas, and they then have to decide which ones are, are worth pursuing. So they all often talk about vision, activeness of mind, thinking outside the box. They'll talk about judgment. You know, they can have lots of ideas, but which ones are actually the good ones? Can the product be developed technically? Will it sell? What does the market research show? And so the idea here is that an entrepreneur has to exhibit a commitment to a cognitive achievement. Right? There has to be intellectual playfulness, research, experimentation, analysis, and judgment. 
One venture capitalist I read put it this way, money doesn't get the ideas flowing, it's ideas that get the money flowing. Now, Steve Jobs was clearly characterized by a confidence in his own creativity and his judgment, and he tells us how he acquired it. His parents had moved with the uh, adolescent Steve Jobs to Los Altos, California, near the heart of Silicon Valley. Many of his neighbors were engineers who would gather in garage workshops after work on weekends to talk and tinker with projects. Jobs' father was a skilled material. He liked rebuilding cars in his spare time. Across the street lived Steve Wozniak. His father was an engineer at Hewlett Packard. The young Jobs played with do-it-yourself Heathkips. All of that environment Jobs explained, quote, gave one the sense that one could build things that one saw around oneself in the universe. These things were not mysteries anymore. I mean, you looked at a television set, you would think, I haven't built one of those, but I could. There's one of those in a Heathkit catalog, and I've built two other Heathkits, so I could build that. Things became much more clear that they were the results of human creation, not these magical things that just appeared in one's environment. It gave a tremendous level of self-confidence that through exploration and learning, one could understand seemingly very complex things. Unquote. All right, so... Not magic, but being in a certain kind of environment of exploration and conversation and people enjoying tinkering right with pro- projects. That's what made jobs possible. In Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, he writes an incredibly crafted and well-argued insight into what postmodernism is, why it exists, and why it is dangerous applied in the wrong dose in the wrong place, as it frequently is in this day and age. Postmodernism has been the most vigorous intellectual movement of the late 20th century. In his book, Hicks traces the roots of postmodernism all the way back to the Enlightenment era, where he systematically charts how the age of reason sowed the seeds of unreason that was to follow, making a clear connection between postmodernism to history, leftist politics, and even the ugliness of contemporary art. Hicks presents his thesis with beautiful, easy-to-understand explanations that burn with logic and common sense. So if you've ever wondered why society holds so many assumptions about the world, and you want to understand the chaos of what is happening, Hicks's work in this book provides a huge piece to this puzzle. Why do sceptical and relativistic arguments have such power in the contemporary intellectual world? Why do they have that power in the humanities but not in the sciences? Why is a significant portion of the political left, the same left that traditionally promoted reason, science, equality for all, and optimism, now switch to the themes of anti-reason, anti-science, double standards and cynicism? This book is by far the most helpful resource I have ever come across for understanding why the world is turning into a direction that I just can't comprehend. Pick up your copy of Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism, and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, available now on Amazon.com. While you're online, make sure to subscribe to the Open College podcast hosted by Stephen Hicks himself, and please leave a review for it on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. All right, next, what about the ambition that's also characteristic of entrepreneurship, that drive to achieve one's goals and to be the best that we can be? You know, lots of people will experience kind of idle wishing. They'll say things to themselves like, you know, wouldn't it be nice if I were rich and independent? But ambitious individuals really feel strongly the need to achieve their goals. And what's involved in that? Now, Steve Jobs' quest to make his products, quote, insanely great, unquote, that speaks of a high ambition. And it's an ambition that embodies a strong integrity. So I think there's a connection here between ambition and integrity, not just saying, but wanting to make it happen really. Jobs uh, liked to use the analogy of a carpenter committed to the highest standards of his craft. Quote, when you're a carpenter making a beautiful chest of drawers, you're not going to use a piece of cheap plywood on the back. I added the word cheap there even though it faces the wall and nobody will ever see it. You'll know it's there. So you're going to use a beautiful piece of wood on the back. For you to sleep well at night, the aesthetic 
the quality has to be carried all the way through. That's ambition. That's integrity. Now, entrepreneurship also requires the initiative, right? We all know it's one thing to have an idea, even a formally worked out business plan. It's another to turn it into reality. So entrepreneurs have to be self-starters who are committed to bringing their ideas into existence. So example again from Steve Jobs, teenager Steve Jobs, he was trying to build a frequency counter, but he needed some fairly sophisticated parts. So uh, he telephoned Bill Hewlett, the co-founder of Hewlett Packard at his home. Right? Hewlett didn't know Steve Jobs, but they talked for 20 minutes and uh, Steve Jobs got the parts as well as a summer job at Hewlett. Packard. Right? So that initiative, right, willingness to go out and, and try, as Jobs did, how do we encourage the kids to pursue their own initiatives? Now, obviously, any entrepreneurial enterprise also involves venturing into the unknown. There's this willingness to take on obstacles, the possibility of failure. Anytime we're dealing with failure, that brings up fear. Entrepreneurship, life in general, of course, requires courage. That means you have to have a willingness to take these calculated risks, to be aware of the downsides, but at the same time, not letting your fear of those possible downsides dominate your decision making. Now, courage is, I think, closely tied to independence of judgment. And one form of fear is the pressure that other people can put on us that can paralyze us and often override our own judgment. So one of uh, Steve Jobs' teacher in high school He uh, taught the school's only course on electronics, pointed out Steve's independent streak here. Quote, he was usually off in a corner doing something on his own and didn't really want to have much of anything to do with me or the rest of the class, unquote. All right, so we can imagine, right, an education environment that encourages and allows for that independent streak rather than authoritarianly or peer pressurely requiring the student to conform. Right? Steve Jobs himself later put it this way when he would say, quote, don't be trapped by dogma, right? which is living the result of other people's thinking. Right? Don't let the noise of other opinions drown your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your own heart and intuition. All right, so success also working our way through that emphasized list of traits requires perseverance, usually requires sticking through difficulties over the long term. Entrepreneurship here again, a lens for life. Entrepreneurs have to pursue through lots of technical obstacles. They have to persevere in the face of naysayers and their own self-doubts. Many entrepreneurs will fail several times before they achieve a resounding success. So again, we can see this in Steve Jobs' life. The scope and the number of his own failures, but his ability to bounce back from them are legendary. The Apple I, Apple II, they sold modestly at the beginning. The Lisa was a dud. Jobs Jobs was then kicked out of Apple. His uh, new company, Next, failed. But he tried again, and he tried different approaches, culminating into a return to a struggling Apple corporation. Even then, Jobs had to ask his great rival, Microsoft's Bill Gates, for a $150 million investment. But the persistence paid off, and Jobs proceeded to transform Apple into a global titan. This is a rejuvenation that uh, one business writer called, quote, the greatest second act in the history of business, unquote. Now, Jobs' long-term funding of Pixar uh, also, I think, il- illustrates this perseverance theme, right? Pixar's model of digitally animated movies, it lost money for years. It was kept afloat primarily because Jobs believed in it and continued to fund it. Eventually, right, Pixar achieved technical and commercial success in movies like uh, Toy Story in 1995, Monsters, Inc. in 2001, The Incredibles in 2004. So where does that perseverance come from, and how can we uh, inculcate that in the students? Entrepreneurial development process, it's always a trial and error process. It means entrepreneurs have to make adjustments based on experience. Successful entrepreneurs are 
going to be responsive to real-world feedback, and they have to be able to admit their errors. They have to be able to say, I failed. So how in schools now do we teach about failure? Is failure something to experience and learn from, or is it something that we make students afraid of, that failure is a bad thing to be avoided at all costs? Steve Jobs, again, his advice to himself and other people, this is uh, quoted in one of his biographies or by one of his biographers, was this. He says, quote, sometimes when you innovate, you make mistakes. It's best to admit them quickly and then get on with improving your other innovations, unquote. So Jobs was regularly willing to abandon unsuccessful approaches, and his perfectionism made him require many iterations in product development before finally achieving the insanely great. Productivity, sticking with it. When the development process finally culminates in a working product, right? the entrepreneur has in fact added some value to the world, but those who are then transacting with the entrepreneur as customers and employees, they're engaging in win-win trade. They're exchanging value for value. Socially trade is this process of dealing with others on a peaceful basis according to productive merit. Now, one of the standout things, again, about Jobs and Apple Corporation is you notice the attitude that the customers have toward their products. It's not just a neutral, humdrum piece of technology that they acquire and they use it right for whatever. If you notice the commitment of Apple's customers to their products, sometimes borders on a religious devotion. And that, I think, is a testament to Jobs's and Apple's internalization and manifestation of this commitment to win-win social exchange. This July, Professor Stephen Hicks is coming to New York. Join him in a live debate discussing whether postmodernism is necessary for apolitics of individual liberty. For the negative, Professor of Philosophy at Rockford University, Executive Director of the Centre of Ethics and Entrepreneurship, and Senior Scholar at the Atlas Society, Stephen Hicks is author of numerous books and published articles on the subject. His opponent for the affirmative will be Thaddeus Russell, a PhD history graduate from Columbia University who heads Renegade University and whose work has been published in multiple mainstream media channels. If you're in New York at the time, seeing these two scholars in a live debate is something you won't want to miss. The event will be held on July 15th at the Subculture Theatre on Bleecker Street, starting at 6.30pm and seating must be reserved in advance. To reserve your spot, go to www dot the soho forum dot org scroll down to the event on monday july 15th and simply click on the buy tickets link and while you're online please give the podcast a review on itunes stitcher spotify or google play and follow us on our social networks at open college podcast now back to the podcast now all right well what about leadership Right. Entrepreneurs also have to bring leadership. They have to be you know, the leaders of their own life, but then if they're successful, that expands socially. They're creating something new, so they're the first to go down a new path. Those who go first, they set an example for others, and especially in the case of making something new, they have to show customers its values. They have to convince people who didn't know about this thing, and they have to teach employees how to make it. Now, Jobs, I think his track record on leadership is mixed, but he spoke of leadership as a critical component of entrepreneurial success. Quote, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower, unquote. And he argued that leadership is the ultimate in human capital. Quote, innovation has nothing to do with how many R&D dollars, that's uh, research and development dollars you have. When Apple came up with the Mac, IBM was spending at least 100 times more on R&D. It's not about money. It's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get it. Unquote. Now, Obviously, Jobs' leadership record is mixed from those who knew him personally and all of the biographies. There are lots of credible accusations that he was often very difficult to work with. He could be impatient, throw tantrums, regularly used verbal abuse to get his way. Sometimes he outright manipulated people. But leaders, especially visionary leaders, have to handle great pressures, and they have to deal with less committed, less competent people. So handling pressure and people gracefully is a key component of 
leadership. So admitting all of Jobs' failures at the same time, there is his undeniable track record as a visionary whose charisma you know, attracted many of the best and the brightest with whom he maintained long-term relationships, whose methods, positive and negative, they did motivate people to accomplish much more than they thought possible. Now, I think another component here about entrepreneurship and life in general is that it's about success and being able to enjoy your successes. Success re- yields you know, material rewards and psychological rewards, you know, the goods that money can buy, but also the experiences of independence and the security that can go with it. And of course, there's that great psychological reward of achievement, that enhanced self-respect that sense of accomplishment, that sense that I did this. And there's a small anecdote, again, biographically, that I'll pull out here that I think, to me, it speaks very charmingly to Steve Jobs' ability to enjoy his success. Uh, His sister, Mona Simpson, in her eulogy for for Steve after his death, told us uh, this, quote, He told me how much he loved going to the Palo Alto bike store and gleefully realizing that he could afford to buy the best bike there. And he did, unquote. All right, so here we have a very ambitious trait, set rather, of entrepreneurial traits. And using Steve Jobs as a particular example of an individual who realized to a high degree many or most of these traits. Knowledge and creativity, ambition, courage, initiative, perseverance, trial and error, experimentalism, productiveness, commitment to trading value for value, leadership, self-esteem, and enjoying success. Now, if that's what we think 21st century life is going to be, and perhaps more broadly, what the best kind of human life is going to be, that those are the traits that are going to make one able best to realize oneself, then when we're dealing with very young human beings as parents and as teachers, the question is, how do we foster them? How do we put those at the top of our educational goals and figure out what we need to do and perhaps stop doing if we're going to help create students at that level? Now here, what I want to do is contrast much of traditional and current schooling. You know, if we're all about exploration, courage, initiative, and so on, and we go into a traditional school, what do we see? We don't see much uniqueness. We don't see much activity. We don't see much experimentalism. Students are often sitting in straight rows of desks. They do what the teacher and the textbook tell them to do. And what we see is every student doing the same thing at the same time, in the same way, and taking the same standardized tests. That is to say, what we see is uniformity, obedience, passivity, and rote learning. Now, I'm not going to deny that there's useful knowledge in the curriculum, Right. The embedded lesson students also learn, though, despite that useful knowledge, is often the opposite. Do what the authorities say. Do what everybody else is doing. The correct answers are preset and already known. And then we wonder sometimes why we've got so many unmotivated, dependent, and timid students or students just who out of sheer boredom and the chaotic human need to be themselves rebel in various destructive ways as they sometimes do as adolescence goes on. But if an explicit goal of education is and should be to cultivate entrepreneurism, as a first step, let's just consider getting students out of the rows and letting them interact with prepared materials, interact with each other, interact with the world, on their own. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time. 
and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favorite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher.